All right. Uh, hope everybody's having a great evening so far. I'm super excited to be here. So uh, this is a really hard talk to give. There's probably hours and hours of content that you could cover. Um, what I'm going to do is um, try to cover just some of the tips that I've learned across the way. And so my hope with this presentation is that everybody walks away with at least one thing um, that's applicable to them that they can go and, and try to experiment with um, back at their um, place of employment. So everybody's seen this, sort of the classic recruiting funnel. I couldn't find a, a commercial free version of this on Google Images, so I, um, I just made it myself this morning. Um, everybody does this. Like, if you hire, you're doing something that looks very similar to this, this process, right? You, you source, you screen, you interview, you offer. Um, this is a, uh, a very ripe area for data-driven improvement processes, right? So sort of becomes something that you can analyze with six-segment techniques and look at inputs and outputs and optimize. Um, and, and that's not really necessarily sufficient either. It's necessary, but it's not going to sort of help you differentiate yourself at scale. And so what I'm going to talk about in this, in this, le in this, in this speech is some, some of the things that I've done to tweak different parts of this process. So like tips at every stage, and then sort of a meta tip uh, that we apply at Qualtrics that's been, that's been very helpful. Um, but first, um, why am I even remotely qualified to talk about this? Um, so like, like Jerry mentioned, I'm the VP of engineering at Qualtrics. Um, and I've been with the company for about three years. Um, right around 2015, you can see where we started hiring. Um, after being relatively flat for a couple of years, we've, we've grown the team um, since I've been there from 50 to about 380 today. Um, prior to Qualtrics, I spent time at a lot of different companies, mostly in Seattle. Um, Ten years with Amazon, I was a bar raiser at Amazon, did 3,000 interviews at Amazon alone. Um, my last job at Amazon, I was a the fifth member of the, um, the Echo team and was responsible for the Alexa software organization and built that from zero to 250 over three years and brought that product to market. So over the course of my career, probably done 5,000 interviews and have scaled multiple engineering organizations to multiple hundreds of people. So that's a little bit more about me. Um, so sourcing, we're going we're gonna to dive right in to sourcing. Um, lots of ground to cover here with sourcing. Um, this is one I got. I just pulled this up randomly. It's a, it's a year old, but this is probably something that's reasonably familiar to a lot of people, right? It's a sort of generic, uh, bland, um, uh, form letter version of a sourcing letter that probably, if, if I did a poll, probably half the people in this room got one that looked like it this week. There's nothing like an unsubscribe button at the end of an outreach from a recruiter to let you know that they uh, really paid personal attention to, to you as a human being. Um, so I, I, I say this not to um, I say this not to you know sort of criticize this particular recruiter or whatever because it's a hard problem, but but really to call out that there's a couple of fundamental problems with sourcing and and, and the, the, the 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 symptom or what ends up happening when you have sourcing techniques like this is that engineers are really good pattern matchers, right? As it turns out, and so um, if you outreach like this, what's going to happen is that you're going to get ignored. And this is why, you know, sort of response rates for average reach out for recruiting teams is so low at the sourcing stage, right? Like, you know, we're, we, we, we do bulk outreach, right? We try to do, um, you know, some targeted bulk outreach, but our response rates are like 5%, if that, if we're lucky. So the problems that we have today with sourcing are, you know, hey, most, most outreach is undifferentiated. Most, most outreach actually doesn't speak to, to career progression. Like one of the major reasons why somebody will bother having a conversation is because they think that it might help them with, you know, sort of professional career trajectory and professional career development. You have to have an understanding of that person's history in order to make that outreach relevant to them. Um, so my first tip, um, and something that we've had a lot of success with at Qualtrics, um, make your engineering managers responsible for sourcing candidates. Um, so I've got about 60 engineers, uh, 60 engineering managers on my team right now are, are, are leaders um, who, are, who are sort of indirectly or, or directly managing people. Um, every single one of them on a quarterly basis takes an OKR, a goal, to, to do outreach to, you know, depending on their hiring needs, anywhere between, you know, say 30 to 50 people in that quarter. And so what they'll do is we provide them with tools like LinkedIn Recruiter, we, we have a, a subscription with Hired, and we really make it a point that we want our hiring managers to like go out and find the candidates 
that they need on their team. It's highly leveraged work. We set the expectation to our hiring managers that about 25% of their time should be spent recruiting. And we need it. Like, you know, with Qualtrics in hyper growth mode, right, it's not just that we need lots of people. We have lots of really cool things we want to build, right? We have roadmaps on teams that span years and years and years. And for us to continue to fuel the business and continue to grow, we need, we need qualified, really awesome engineers. Um, when we've done this, we've seen our response rates go up dramatically. I don't know if um, other folks in the room have done this, but, um, you know, it's a really cheap experiment to go do. Like, go send out 10 emails that are highly targeted and that where you've spent, you know, at least five minutes reading through their background experience and understanding what they've accomplished and how it relates to the work that you're doing and how the role that you have for them might be uh, the next logical step in their career progression. Um, we see response rates up to 30%, 40% when we do this. Um, and so this has been a game changer for us in order to be able to staff effectively in the Seattle area, which is a very competitive talent market. So um, on to the next phase, <coughs> screening. Um, this is a really interesting, um, this is a really, really interesting um, uh, part of the process as well. Um, in my experience, this is the part of the process where you can really, um, like, so for a large organization, so you have 100 engineers um, uh, or 200 engineers, and, and they're spending, say, 20% of their time a week interviewing or doing tech screens, you know, maybe five to ten hours a week. You start to very quickly get into thousands and thousands of hours of engineering time invested in recruiting a quarter, right? The numbers add up, and they get really big. And that is time that those engineers aren't actually like innovating or writing code or building new features. Um, and it's often like not even, you, a lot of people don't even pay attention to it, right? And so for us, one of the things that I'm, I'm super uh, aware of in the, in the screening process is making sure that we're not having an ineffective screening processes that cause a bunch of downstream waste in the system. So um, my tip number two and this is going to be, you know, self-obvious and maybe a little bit of mom and apple pie, but it's know who you want, right? Um, we, the number of times I've had the conversations that I've listed here, these are not hypothetical examples. These are things that I've, these are conversations I've had in the last year, right? Where you end up going through this super expensive process, right, to get up to an offer decision or a debrief decision and the candidate's like, oh, yeah, well, as it turns out, I don't actually want to work for a startup, right? Or um, the hiring manager's like, well, you know, we really wanted somebody with mobile experience. And so now we have to reloop that candidate with another team, right? A waste of time, super, super inefficient. Or there's just a basic policy stuff, like so Qualtrics doesn't have a, a, a formal work-from-home policy, right, that we're not just taking care of at the front end of the process, Right? And so the, the screening process is all about finding that sort of the sweet spot of intersection between false negatives and false positives to make the rest of your funnel really efficient. But the thing that we've been really careful about and that I believe has helped us scale is knowing who we want in the screening process. It's been really, really critically important for us. Um, I think I've talked a little bit more, more about this. So we'll go on to the third stage, interviewing. Um, I had to put the Dilbert comment in. It's, Pretty hilarious. Um, so this, I think, is the most critical part of the recruiting process, right? Um, and at scale, um, the problems that you, if you have like problems in your interviewing process and you're trying to hire a handful of engineers, like you can typically manage it, right? And it, it doesn't become sort of catastrophic. But at scale, like if you are, if you're trying to hire a hundred engineers, you're trying to hire. 50 college engineers, and you have problems in how you interview, those, those can become significant problems, right? Because they become significant in terms of who you're bringing in the house, what kind of decisions you're making downstream. And I, I thought I'd give a little bit of an example on this. Early on in my career at Amazon, we were bringing aboard, uh, you know, just a handful of college engineers onto our team. And so we got plugged into the college recruiting process, and we sort of you know, there wasn't a whole lot of existing frameworks in place for how you evaluate candidates. And so we came up with our, we kind of came up with our own, right? They're like, everybody's like, you know, college graduates, they should have a really solid understanding of data structures. Everyone's like, yes, nodding their heads. We, everybody agrees, college hires, we should have a really good understanding of, of data structures. So we go and interview about 10 candidates. And it turns out, 
One engineer on my team interpreted that to be, hey, can college candidates should be able to do, you know, write prototype code for an insert in a red black tree, right? And one of my, my one of my engineers was like, oh yeah, they should know the runtime for a, the big O runtime for a lookup on a hash table. Um, those are, as it turns out, uh, orders of magnitude more uh, difficult problems than each other, and it's really hard to draw a comparison between the two, right? Like. Um, and, and we really, we really struggled, right? Like we, we just didn't have, we had no standardized baseline for making as objective a decision as you can possibly make in a what is it, is ultimately like a subjective process, right? Um, and so I say that because my third tip, as it relates just to the core interviewing process, is that standardization for me at scale has just been totally key and critical for us to scale our process. So, benefits of standardization, right? Reduces bias, not, doesn't eliminate, right? Reduces bias. It helps ensure consistency for the bar that you're trying to establish. It provides, this is super important, a lot of people don't, don't get this, but standardization in the interview process and in the phone screen process provides your recruiting team and your recruiting partners with the foundational data that they need to be predictive, right? So, hey, we wanna hire you know, 100 people this year, you know, so we can advance the business. Um, and as it turns out, our forecasts, based off all the telemetry that your team is spinning out, is at 70. Well, if that data is sound and that forecast is based off of, like, standardized data, then you can start to think about other levers that you want to pull, right, to address the gap. But if that data is noisy and there's a lot of variance in it or the team isn't confident of their forecast, then... You have, a, you have a problem, right? You have to sort of wait another quarter, right, to see whether or not you're actually going to hit your numbers. Um, the, 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 the last one is it makes for a great candidate experience, right? Like it, standardization, you know, if, you're, if you have a standard process in terms of like, hey, here's how we think about, you know, treating the candidates who come through the door. They're real human beings. Let's make sure that we adhere to these rules and principles. It allows you to sort of improve on candidate experience. And then finally, and this is one that I, I, I didn't realize until reasonably late in my career, it actually makes the people who are interviewing feel more comfortable, right? That they are able to assess the bar correctly. Like, one of the questions that we got really early on at Qualtrics from a lot of our, our inter engineers who were interviewing was, how do I know what the bar is, right? Well, what is a bar, and like, how do I assess it? And so, standardization has been really important in that regard. Um, this is not easy, <laughs> right? Like, a lot of people think about this, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we do it, but like, I, I would challenge you to really think about how well you do it. Like, we spend a lot of time at Qualtrics thinking about standardization, rolling out training programs, I, analyzing the questions that we're asking, um, building content, building training programs. Like, it's a full person's job to think about standardization for our recruiting process scale, right? And, um, and, and we've seen some remarkable re results from rolling out standardization at, at, at Qualtrics where, you know, not only became more efficient, we saw improvements in candidate experience. Um, it was, it's, it's been re really, really important for us at scale to, to have this. Um, but it's a lot of work. So, last stage, debrief offer stage. So, um, I often get this a lot from, from the folks on my team. It's like, why do we even have this thing, which I'm going to tell you in a second. Um, but like, assuming that you've done all the other things that I've talked about and that you have um, a healthy funnel and that you have standardized interviews and you think about feedback the same way and your organization is well trained, then like a hiring decision should be really easy, right? Like if, it, if they get to the other end and everybody's inclined, then you should just like make an offer. Um, not exactly, right? And so this is the other secret at scale, at sort of bit, at, at substantial scale, right? When you're onboarding hundreds of engineers a year, right, you have to think about a systems of checks and balances, right? I've heard this, this exact quote with like sub performance with like mobile or, you know, back in my day, I guess it would have been like C++ or, um, I've heard this, this exact quote like at least five to 10 times in my career from a hiring manager, right? Um, and, and it's, important, you know, like, and it's totally natural, and it's not, it's, it's sort of human nature. You should not underestimate a hiring manager's desire to eliminate pain and to paper over, you know, sort of a feedback or, or signs that they're seeing in the interview process as things that can be managed or coached out, right? 
And that's why it's really important to have a systems of checks and balances at scale for organization. And a lot of them, a lot of big companies have it, right? And so, um, you, know, my, you know, before I go into which companies do it, like, like companies do this, like Microsoft has the as app interview, uh, Amazon has the bar raiser program, Google has a committee based approach. They all share something in common, right? Which is that they have a pool of trusted and proven employees who are chartered and empowered with maintaining the bar. And the thing that hiring managers need to realize, right, is they're not, you're not hiring for your team. I mean, you are hiring for your team, but ultimately you're hiring for the company, right? And, and, and that the hiring decision that you're making as a, as a hiring manager is, is going to outlast your tenure um, in, in most situations, right? And so, so this is why we, you know, at, at Qualtrics, we have a, a committee-based process sort of m modeled after, after Google where um, we have, you know, this entire funnel set up um, and we have all the interviews happening and then we have group debriefs. And then ultimately, every single hire is reviewed by myself and, my, um, and the co-founder of the company, Jared Smith. And we spend a lot of time every week um, looking and reading feedback. It's, I probably spend two hours a week reading interview feedback. Um, it's that important, right? It's, it's a super leveraged position that we're in, and so that's something that we take really seriously for hiring at scale as well. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is candidate experience. So a lot of people don't know what Qualtrics does, and if they do know what Qualtrics does, they're like, isn't that the survey company? Um, which is true. <laughs> um, but over the last couple of years, we've started building what we call experience management solutions, and, and, and so we build software products that enable some of the biggest brands in the world to run employee experience and, and customer experience programs. Um, and we've been able to take internally inside of engineering, we like to dog food our own product, it's, it's super healthy, um, and sometimes hard to actually do with B2B software, but what we've done is taken our platform, we've spun up what we call a candidate experience program, right? Well, we'll take feedback data from Glassdoor and we'll, we'll actually send surveys to our candidates post-interview and ask them a series of questions, including some open-ended text comments that you see here, and every single one of those is looked at on a weekly basis. Like, we look at every single piece of feedback that we get on Glassdoor, we look at every single post-interview survey, and I, I'll have to tell you that you can have all the operational data in the world about your sort of, you have all the telemetry in the world and all the operational data in the world about how your process is working, but if you don't collect this experience data, then you are gonna miss major holes in your process, right? The number of changes that we've been able to make to our process based off of the data that we're collecting has been uh, pretty significant. You know, everything from uh, eliminating, we used to do six interviews on site, now we do four for certain job families, right? Um, we were miscalibrated and we were asking people with three to five years of experience um, interview questions that they just, on average, had not yet encountered in the real world, like system design problems that like, you know, 10 years of SDs with 10 years of experience would struggle with. We learned that through this survey. We've actually taken individuals out of, of, of sort of eligibility for interviewing based off of the feedback that we've seen in these surveys and, and, and what we've seen on Glassdoor. And so I would strongly encourage you at scale to sort of think about alternative feedback loops that you can build into your processes so that you can um, continue to make changes, and, and it's really that, that combination of, of that, that experience data, that feedback data, and all the operational data that's going to let you differentiate your, your hiring processes. Um, this is just another view of, of the sort of the real-time data that we get from our, our, um, our candidates as they, as they go through the process. Um, it's, been, it's been profoundly impactful for us. Um, so that's it. Um, those are, th that's my talk, the sort of five tips and things that I've learned along the way in sort of bu building and scaling big teams. Um, hope that at least one of them resonated with, uh, with the audience, and uh, if anybody has any questions or feedback or other recommendations for things that we could be doing better, um, come hit me afterwards. Thanks again.